Okay, so thanks for having me uh, in, in Kuva. It's a uh, real honour to be invited to, to come and talk to you here in the new building as well. It's a while since I've been here. The last time I was here uh, was at conference next door, and this was not uh, in existence. So it's really incredible to see it sort of materialise out of nowhere as, uh, as far as um, uh, my own experience is concerned. And maybe what I'm going to talk about today is quite apt. In, in that sense, there's a, a kind of reimagining of Kuva uh, and its new home. And what I'm going to talk about to some extent is that, <clears throat> that very idea of what it might mean to try and reimagine the art school. Um, I'm going to try and put that in a bit of a context, uh, which does go back some way. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of a sense of why and this came about and maybe where it, where it uh, started for me. But I'm mainly going to talk about some of the more theoretical or uh, transform, uh, maybe um, transferable ideas uh, that, that have emerged through uh, thinking about the relationship between artistic learning and, and paragogy. So I um, suppose really for me, uh, the background is, is very specifically within an art school context. I've taught in art schools exclusively for 25 years or so, mainly in Europe and North America. And over that time, increasingly I've tended to focus on experimentation within the art curriculum. And I suppose one of the key things I've been interested in for a long time is the fact that the art curriculum isn't really codified. And in order to try and resurrect it, we need to create some sort of performative specter. And I, I, over the years, I've come to call that organology. So I've kind of nicked the idea from music that organology is a a form of, let's say, performative reanimation of the past, uh, creating tools or instruments in the case of music that you can use to reconstruct and play with some of these artistic learning rituals that we might have had in the past. And I've also done that by working with artists who in their own right have maybe been attached to the mythos of the art school. So, uh, for example, Terry Atkinson, um, here is, is heavily attached to the mythos of Coventry and Art and Languages Art Theory Programme. So it's a, it's a question in, in part of trying to work with people who are still around. You know, they're, most of the figures that I'm interested in are either really old or they're recently deceased, I would say, most of the pioneers. Or it's a, a question of trying to resurrect and reanimate what we might be able to unearth uh, of, of what there is, which is not much to go on. So in, in around uh, 2010, I started to run the MFA in Edinburgh. And uh, at that point, I was, I was trying to, kind of, I guess, converge some of these ideas around organology with curating uh, and to think through what some of those ideas might do in a curatorial context. And I was asked to curate an exhibition at Edinburgh Sculpture Workshop as part of the Edinburgh Art Festival. Um, and that exhibition became shift work. Uh, and shift work was really more of a process than an outcome. Um, and in a way, that was a very deliberate thing within the context of Edinburgh Festival. I wanted to do something that wasn't a spectacle and that didn't just simply offer you know, another exhibition as part of, uh, say, the Art Festival. So we set up this thing really that was a kind of collective inquiry and it took place over six days. There were three workshops, two days each, and uh, a group of people took part in them right through and I suppose became part of that process. And it was really only meant to be a one-off thing, but in essence I haven't really stopped doing it. It's, it's really just become uh, a group. There's a group of people uh, that include me who, who do it regularly and, uh, and other people are able to take part in it because it's open. And I'll explain why it's open and how as I, as I continue here. Um, at the time that I started to do this, the theory of paragogy was beginning to emerge. Um, and I didn't really become aware of paragogy, I think, until around 2013. But it starts to emerge around 2010. And I suppose in that sense, 
for me, what I would now call paragogy or paragogics was something that became imminent in the practice. So it, be, it kind of became imminent in shift work itself. And it wasn't really until, um, you know, I, I started to become more familiar with what was, what was being produced within or under the auspices of paragogy that I saw that there was this very direct connection. So the practice of shift work itself is the thing that ultimately informed this book that I wrote that Magnus mentioned, uh, 2019 it came out, it's called Reimagining the Art School. What I'm going to do with the first part of this talk is jump into the middle. So I'm really going to focus a lot on some of the things that are in that book, and I'm not going to dwell so much more on what happened with shift work and how it took me there. The book as well, I'd say it's peppered with lots of real life or real world practices that we could consider to be paragogic. But what I've done here is strip quite a lot of that out so that we just focus on the transferable theory. And by that, I mean it can be transferred to any realm. It's not just simply about how we teach art or even art and design. Um, at the end, then, what I'll do is I'll jump back to give just one example of how I've put paragogics into practice over the last year or so in, uh, in Edinburgh in the form of an open educational resource which is called Contemporary Art and Open Learning. Okay, so to begin with, I, I wanted to paraphrase the educational historian Sheldon Rothblatt by proposing that there can be no singular idea of the art schools. Rothblatt says there's no singular idea of the university. Um, so today's European art academies really are assemblages of pre-modern and modern spatial and ideological formations, which were developed as Europeans began to detach themselves from the world system. And this is really something that happens from the 12th century onwards into the 16th century. So uh, the, the roots of the early European universities and the guild shop technical apprenticeship really had a lot in common, particularly in the 12th century. For example, the structure and the values of um, the civic craft guilds and the universities in their early years were both managed by similar forms of incorporation. So uh, corporatus, or the forming of a corpus or a body, was something that enabled individuals to associate to their mutual advantage. In the medieval words, universitas and guild were really interchangeable for those kinds of bodies politic. So from an organisational perspective then, any art school or the idea of the art school is really a universitas or a corporate association or a group which forms when and where self-identifying art students seek to learn together. So the universitas or the art school isn't a place, it's a body. Um, as is the case today, medieval educational corporations created and maintained professional standards. So the 11th century academic and technical apprenticeship models of education were procedural, standardised systems of learning that socially regulated their pro respective professional domains. The disciplina, the Latin root of discipline, signified both instruction and knowledge, system and method. The 12th century studium generale scholar, or the you know, early university scholar, and the master craftsman would both agree that professional competence must result from disciplinary training. And this is something that resonates into the present. However, in spite of their common organisational ancestry in the medieval universities, art academies today tend to perform what I would call a disassociative identity. So they have a split personality they're split between ours and techni. In this sense, uh, I would say that the art school is diglossic. Um, it's an institution that speaks more than one dialect. So it speaks the same language, but it speaks in two or more dialects. And it oscillates back and forth. 
in that sense, between the codified knowledge of the arts liberales, the scholarship of the early universitas, and the tacit knowledge or the know-how of professional apprenticeship. This kind of heterogeneity is not uncommon in educational imaginaries, so it's not a thing that's just unique to the art school. The educationalist Gerb Biesta, for example, says that there is no singular sense of purpose for education per se. Rather, there are what Biesta calls multiple domains of purpose. And these domains have three co-present generic characteristics, which Biesta defines as socialization, subjectification, and qualification. So socialization for Biesta relates to the ways in which groups of learners form and are in turn formed by being part of a cohort. Subjectification would relate to the ways in which our identities are shaped through socialization. And qualification is a triangulation. It triangulates socialization and subjectification by confirming what our newly formed identities enable us to do. So the examples I've used here are all to do with leather workers, the University of Leather Workers. Um, would, you could apply it to you know, any, any kind of craft um, discipline uh, in that way. So following Biesta's triad of characteristics, what I'm going to do just now is quickly compare qualification and socialization as they were manifest in pre-modern technical and liberal arts education alike. And I'm going to do that simply by focusing on the formation of the studio. So the studio is a modern invention, and I'm going to look at how it formed as just one example of how we could use Biesta's triad. So starting with socialization, we could focus on the habitat on the, and the idea of the studio as a habitat. And today's art schools still offer this bespoke habitat in the form of the studio, and they still call it the studio, um, as a shorthand, perhaps, for identifying that. It's a habitat, ultimately, in which relations or relationships and habits are embodied. So the studio is deeply implicated, then, in what Biesta calls socialization. However, the studio habitat is neither an essential nor an inevitable means of socialising artistic learners. So, uh, for example, Pierre Bourdieu and Marcel Mauss alike both argued that the reproduction of learning rituals, or habitus as they both called it in a different ways, is something that's not reliant on the continued maintenance of a specific learning environment or a habitat, in our case, the studio. This means really that the studio is not an eternal structure that regulates practice. Rather, as Bourdieu and Mouse would say, practice reproduces itself. Now, whatever you think about Bourdieu and Mouse, you can put to one side, um, just do a brief history, or rather prehistory of the studio, to see that um, this is indeed true, that the, the pra because practice changes over time, what happens is arts learning environments also transform. It's a bilateral exchange between the, the habit and the habitas, in other words. So the presentist perception we have of this ars techni division, or this tension between ars and techni, is something really that tends to arise from a widespread misconception, that being that the sites of technical education or the studio have always been physically distinct from those occupied by the liberal arts or the studium uh, or the study, let's say. So in 12th century Europe, there, there is some truth to this. The liberal arts student would be someone who would inhabit a very distinct learning environment, say from a technical apprentice. Technical education was still taking place in closed circles and very much on a practical basis. Apprentices and students of the liberal arts also belong to very distinct socioeconomic groups, 
liberal arts students were generally young aristocrats, uh, as um, you'd find, say, in Umberto Eco's Bordolino. Um, Bordolino's like this young aristocrat studying at the University of Paris. Um, and this, of course, generates class divisions that the disciplinary demands of, of these kinds of study would purposefully safeguard. So it's a deliberate attention to keep those classes uh, separate and uh, distinct. Um, while this, um, this bifurification or this split had certainly had some currency back in the 12th century in Europe, by the time that art academies start to emerge in mid-16th century Italy, the distinctions uh, are supposed to have been then superseded by forms of organisation that collectively constitute what we now think of as the formation of fine art. That's when fine art starts to materialise as a thing. So in short, uh, the scholastic model of the artist's studium or study and the rebranding of the artist as a polymathic scholar were the founding principles of Europe's art academies. The liberal arts then informed the material conditions under which the Renaissance artist would work that is, quietly contemplating in private rather than labouring collectively in a busy workshop. So, I mean, that's the, you know, that's the sort of standard history of European uh, art as it emerges in that period. Now, the modern invention of fine art, however, didn't simply emasculate what came before. What we have is a palimpsest. There's no sort of sudden switch from pre-modern to modern overnight. And so medieval scholastic and workshop habitats and the respective habitus of both of those environments were, were really both recruited into this modern project of fine art, of what we think of now as, as art. So following Manuel de Landa, uh, we could ask what, what kind of different interactions were facilitated by this new assemblage, at these two kind of... Uh, forms of habitus being recruited into a singular project. Now, there are two examples here I've given. You can think of more, I'm sure, but here are two that are still very much active today in art schools. Um, so firstly, uh, what we have is um, the workshop studium habitat. Um, we can say that the workshop studium assemblage is something that starts to produce these different interactions between the mechanical arts and the liberal arts. And in doing so, it starts to territorialise the techni of painting and drawing and sculpture. And it sort of reconstitutes those things as forms of scholarship. Um, that might be one of the reasons why now we might talk about painting and sculpture as forms of, say, artistic research. Um, secondly, the transfiguration of the workshop master into an artist is something that reconfigured the pre-modern workshops division of labour. So in effect, what it did was create a class of technicians. And much of the early modern era workshop studium division of labour is something that survives into the present day. So the art world still privileges aristocratic organisational hierarchies that we would associate with the uh, cognitive values of the liberal arts. Uh, it, it promotes those values or privileges them over and above the incorporated management of haptic skills. And that's still a, a strong division of labour. And in today's art schools, or certainly in my art school, the valorisation of the technician remains demoted relative to that of the artist. So in Biesta's terms of subjectification, this workshop studium habitat, which forms into the studio assemblage, is one that really supports an idealised vision of the artist. The idea of the Renaissance art is this, is it, it's like an idea of an artist rather than a reality. Um, and this studio is an assemblage which promotes that idea. Uh, but in doing so, the idea of the artist uh, is accompanied with the idea of the technician, they're both forms of subjectification that emerge at that point, and they coincide, they coincide neatly with the idea of the art school, which is the habitat which socialises both the artist and the technician and brings them 
into being. So, come back to diglossia. What's this got to do with diglossia? Well, the liberal arts doesn't simply turn up and immediately replace or subsume techni. Rather, the liberal arts come along at a certain point in history and come to organise techni uh, to speak or, more accurately, write on behalf of techni. Uh, so artisans with writing were basically in a position to formally codify some of the tacit knowledge of the workshop. And they did this in the form of craft manuals. It's at that point that craft manuals start to be properly published and made available more widely, rather than kept as a secret for the guild, let's say. Um, they also, um, at that point, what you start to see is writing slowly start to territorialise what are these more tacit or vernacular forms of education which we would have associated with the craft guilds. And they do this by transforming those forms of education into a written and specifically Latinate educational project. So they're written in Latin and not in a vernacular language like French or English. The Art Academy then is something that teach or teaches or started to teach its students from an early um, period to speak this polymathic lingua franca of the liberal arts and literally to speak Latin and it essentially determines to translate the specialist argots or the vernaculars of techni into this lingua franca. So while there are many different ways in which the universitas and the craft guild differed, there are enough significant commonalities to enable the art academy to assemble from their components. So the Art Academy is an assemblage of these two things. It's not uh, simply a continuation of one or the other. Um, and they both then have perfectly legitimate claims to informing the kinds of diglossic subjectification that are still practiced in art academies today. So this diglossia then is a useful tool to think about uh, or to use perhaps to explain why there continues to be a tension between at very least two different kinds of educational ritual within contemporary art schools. Now, I would say that um, this is not normally how most people think about it, or most art schools don't think about it in this way, but I would say this kind of diaglossia isn't a curse in search of a cure. It's not something we need to weed out, or we don't need to take one side over the other. And I think we can't, we cannot do that. Um, there are dangers in narrowing ideas of educational purpose into a singular ethics. Um, the boundary theorist Michel Lamont, for example, highlights identification and rationalization are fundamental types of microcultural processes that feed into inequality by stigmatizing whatever dominance deemed to not belong. So they're always exclusionary formations uh, inherent in, in these kinds of microcultural processes. So in imagining different ideas of the art school, we're always forced to generate different boundary formations. And those formations territorialize art students as subjects by creating group composition and differentiation. So it's always something that we do. We can't avoid it. So we might demythologize any given art school's preferred ancestry folklore, its story of where it comes from, <clears throat> in other words, and that might open up some spaces for new things to emerge, for alternative imaginaries, let's say. But those alternate imaginaries will always create new constraints, and of course those constraints themselves are, are, are enabling and, uh, and restricting in different ways. So for me, the question is more focused on um, thinking about the nature of what it is that's enabled and disabled by constraints. For me, that's the thing that is of primary importance in art education, not simply uh, thinking about which of the constraints we, we prefer to, to, uh, to practice uh, due to our perception of our ancestry. Now, I'm going to just demonstrate using some imaginaries how this would work in practice. So if we try and uh, you know, uh, deploy this idea, 
um, we, we can kind of see what sort of impact it might have. So here are two, uh, sorry, um, where am I? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, so there are two mutually constitutive questions manifest in any idea of the art school. One is a concept of art and the other is a concept of studentship. So a concept of art is essentially the question, what is it that will be learned? What is to be learned? And a concept of studentship would be, the answer to that, uh, a concept of studentship would emerge by trying to answer the question, how might it be learned? And since there are no essential components of an artistic curriculum, there aren't any straightforward answers to these two questions. So you know, we say, well, which concept of art or you know, which concept of studentship are we talking about here? So as a thought experiment, what I want to do is just pick on two hidden forms of identification and rationalization uh, that play out in a couple of different art school imaginaries. And by doing that, I can show you quickly how Working with those um, identifications can let us think about how art schools would manage their material resources in more equitable ways. Um, so I'm going to start with a couple of imaginaries that I think still have a hold in art education. You know, they might not be uh, as prevalent here in Helsinki, but you know, they're recognisable in lots of different art schools that I've uh, visited or taught in. So here, here are two. Um, the first one. I've called homo artifacts, uh, what we could also call the homo artifacts, a monotechnician, or as the Germans call them, a fach idiot, uh, a kind of subject specialist, someone who's over-specialised and knows uh, more and more about less and less. And the second one is the monad, and a monad is someone who follows the Delphic principle, to, uh, in other words, they seek to know thyself, they're self-directed, self-investigators. Um, so they're both kinds of uh, subject that uh, exist in, in, in art schools. They're imaginaries, of course, but they are, they're both uh, there. And sometimes, uh, you know, they're in the tension. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they're, they're fused. Um, but they both claim to have their origins in this diglossic formation of the European Art Academy. And they both uh, subjectify art students in really very particular ways that I would say are neither inevitable nor are wholly justifiable. So by asking what is to be learned and how is it to be learned of each of these ideas of the art school, what we start to do is address some of the ways in which different answers to these questions will territorialize art students as particular kinds of subject. We can start to understand what that might do. So I don't have time to do that, this afternoon. What I'll do uh, is just focus on one of these two imaginaries. I'm going to focus on the second one, the monad, uh, or you know what it means to try to seek to know thyself. <clears throat> so taking this, this kind of uh, subject, we can say, well, what, what is to be learned here? Uh, and in relation to the imaginary of the monadic self-investigator, uh, Delphic principle, this will throw up a number of different things. So an art school imaginary that's underwritten by the Delphic principle is one, uh, in essence, which I, I would say tends to follow a hidden curriculum. But it tends to do that in the guise of the anti-curriculum. So people who uh, espouse the Delphic principle generally are against the idea of there being a curriculum or perceive that what they do is not a curriculum. However, I would say clearly that what they do is a hidden curriculum and it generally, uh, as such, it contends that what is to be learned is something which is at best unscripted or emergent. In this sense, then, this, this kind of art school imaginary is one which faithfully reproduces the liberal Rousseau, Frobo, Montessori reform tradition of learner-centered constructivism that emerged at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century. And it's a pro an approach that started really to transform art education a bit later again, you know, and it got into the early 20th century and most obviously in the Bauhaus, and there was a strong, you know, personal connection between Frobo and, say, Gropius, for example. Um, but again, only, only then, the, this kind of Frobelian, Rousseauian, Frobo, uh, Montessori kind of tradition, it only starts to become more dominant 
beyond Bauhaus as modernism takes root across Europe and, and then beyond uh, in, uh, other parts of the world. Uh, and really that's something that only <coughs> kicks off in the 60s, 1960s. So in line with this sort of Rousseau, Frobo, Montessori pedagogy, this approach has tended to enthrone the personal predilections of the emergent learner. It does that really because it's actually uh, for, for like preschool kids, it's for kindergarten children, not for adults. It's a pedagogy. Pedagogy means teaching children. So the art school imaginaries that are emergent here are, in this, perhaps for this reason, they're epistemologically anomalous within higher education. And I think they are in one really readily discernible way. So of its students, the, um, the, the, the art school in this model emphatically declares to its students, you are an artist, while a university would tend to quietly intone, you may make a contribution to your discipline. Now, this is an anathema, ultimately, this, this idea of, of um, the, the monad is really an anathema to any kind of specialist understanding of discipline which is something that exists both in universities and monotechnics. It's anathema to the idea of discipline that is inherited from the medieval craft guilds because a discipline is something that implies at least a continuous pre-existing body of practice or habitus, while the personalized ontology of the monad doesn't require that. So it doesn't really need you to join a discipline. It doesn't have necessarily anything to do with discipline, or it needn't have anything to do with discipline. So since the answer here to this question, what is to be learned, is effectively you tell us, this particular version of art education is something that's predominantly empowered the development of personalized ontologies. Meanwhile, universities and, and monotechnics, which are you know, um, still in existence, they continue to try to persuade their students to join disciplines. Now, I think this is it's quite a subtle distinction, but it's an important one, because while an academic discipline can be said to be a form of collective wisdom, and a, a form of collective wisdom that precedes and informs learning, a personalized ontology is really one that just draws its sustenance mainly from self-investigations of the sovereign subject. So it's, it's really focused on, in terms of personhood formation, on this particular idea of the sovereign subject, which itself is a, a historical construct. So for this kind of imagined art school, the, the, the monad uh, imaginary, art students' main reason for gathering to develop and share things is really that they're, they're gathering to develop and share a common preoccupation with themselves. Okay, so. This then leads me to you know, the second part of the question, well, how are we to learn this? How do you learn how to know yourself? Now, that's not an unusual question, but you know, humans have asked that question forever, and they've got all sorts of different answers to it. You know, there's all sorts of forms of wisdom and philosophy seeking to try to understand that in many different ways. But in terms of the sort of monad uh, imaginary in the art school, as a way of supporting identification, these, this sort of monadic practice of self-knowledge is actually quite useful because it evades the really thorny issue of trying to establish an educational consensus. And in a diglossic uh, culture, as we have in art schools, we can at least uh, agree that we can occupy ourselves with ourselves since it encourages some sort of rapprochement between these two sides, these kind of, you know, these two dialects. There are lots of ways, as I said, you could learn to know yourself, but the Delphic idea of the art school tends to understand this in relation to these two overlapping forms of social conditioning here. Um, I'd say that they're actually distinct, but in the art school they tend to overlap and get muddled up and, uh, and muddied together. So homo sejuris is how you learn how to become an independent practitioner, and homo ars is learning how to construct an artistic identity. Now, there are obviously different things, because you can pretend to be an artist and have an identity as such, but have no practice, and vice versa, perhaps. Uh, so they are distinct, but obviously we'd want them to, <laughs> to like fuse together. Now, in learner-centered education, uh, an independent practi practitioner is, is deemed to be one who understands their professional autonomy 
as a researcher and uses that autonomy to transform and empower themselves. So to that end, most disciplines will try to teach some kind of modicum of what they would see to be their professional skills or acumen. Uh, they'll codify that, they'll teach it. Art students, however, in the monadic imaginary, are, are generally expected to be autodidacts, to determine, in other words, and teach themselves those skills. Autodidacticism is how learning to be an independent practitioner overlaps with homo ars, or the idea that we are here to learn how to construct an artistic identity. It's one of the reasons the presence of autodidacticism is one of the reasons why these two things get confused for one another. <laughs> so the Delphic idea of the art school celebrates self-discovery as being synonymous with this different project of how we construct artistic identity. The, the, the project of constructing an artistic identity, in other words, tends to be presented as a highly individualized affair and one that aligns with the maturation of the self. And, and I, I think it's pretty obvious that it, it, it isn't the same thing as a, as a mature self or you know, maturation of personhood. Uh, so um, just to, get, to put it in a different context, maybe pull it back to the, the, the Middle Ages and like Germanophone Europe, uh, we had the van der Jara, the, the artist or the artisan as it would have been as, as a journeyman. Um, so if we, if we just sort of steal that medievalism, uh, the artist as journeyman, we could say, does the nomadic van der Jara construct an artistic identity through the acquisition of professional competence, which results from their disciplinary training? So that, you know, the, um, the journeyman would go on a literal tour of German-speaking towns and villages and pick up, say, their leather trade from lots of different masters before returning to where they started. So does it construct a kind of professional competence? That, that's really what it was supposed to do. Or does it uh, constitute some sort of existential path that art students have to travel differently? So, you know, is, it, is this kind of forking path something that is uh, essential to authenticate self-knowledge? Now, I ask that knowing that generally in an, in an art, a fine art environment, the second explanation is, is generally what we are looking for. We, we want people to sort of find their own way and have their own sort of take on things. But someone who has a strong root in apprenticeship models of education would, would recognize the first of those things, possibly as being more important. Um, so there are quite different uh, <laughs> ways in which it, immediately we can start to pick that apart. So rather than actually trying to attempt to answer that question, how is it to be learned? I think what actually happens in a lot of art schools, and you see this in the prospectuses if you pick through them, but they, what they tend to do is just chant the mantra, the Delphic mantra, know thyself. They don't ever really seek to pick it apart or explain it. They just simply repeat it. And it's reproduced through what um, uh, organizational studies calls institutional mimetic isomorphism, which ba basically is just a kind of circular thought contagion. Um, and the result of that be, is really that um, most fine art programs promise that they uniquely have the means to nurture the unique identities of their students, but they all do this by subjectivizing them through protracted studio socialization. So they place them in the studio, the studio will do the job of socializing them and make them into these uh, subjects, so, you know, artists, let's say. Okay, so, um, we could say, we could counter that and say, well, if you're locked down in the studio, then, uh, you know, your student journey will tend to be more monadic than nomadic. You know, you're not going anywhere uh, in the way the journeyman did. And equally, you might say, well, <clears throat> maybe studio socialization, socialization is something that's more likely to make students institutionally dependent practitioners because they often uh, will leave art school and form something that uh, is very similar uh, to the thing that they've left. They'll find a studio or form one and they'll form a group and so on. Uh, so it makes them institutionally dependent uh, or makes them seek out or seek to become institutions uh, in terms of, you know, subjects. So as a, as a kind of rationalization then, this 
educational voice, this Delphic principle, know thyself. It's a concept of art, as hopefully I've demonstrated. It is a particular concept of art. It's not the only one, um, but it's basically the what of art education we're talking about here in this imaginary. Uh, but it's also a concept of studentship or the how, and it creates particular kinds of human subjects. And it invites students and tutors to identify with a singular ethics, because if it is the, uh, the prospectus of a program, a degree program, then that's a singular ethics. It's saying this is what this program does. It will make you into this kind of uh, subject. And so as a rationalization, self-knowledge, the, the Delphic principle, it, it naturalizes a very particular set of internal values. These are values like very much internal to these art academies. Um, it naturalizes them as if they were meta values. Um, and I guess what we need to do is, is recognize that there are always other values. Other values are always possible. And we need to remember, of course, as well, that art academies actively choose to socialize self-learning. So to paraphrase Simon O'Sullivan, art schools restrict collective practices, those that deliberately turn from the production of atomized subjectivities towards intersubjective phenomena that might be subject to social forms of discipline building. I and mean, that's Simon O'Sullivan's particular take on that, uh, based in Goldsmiths. Um, now, uh, since it is the disciplinary culture through which staff and students are invited, to form a community of practice. And ethics is really unavoidable. It's vital we can't not have an ethics. Whichever way it's designed, as I said earlier, it, whichever way you design it, an art curriculum's always gonna tend to support and deny particular forms of identification. So we just we choose a different imaginary. It will enable and disable other things. and It, it might shut out some of the things that I've just described, some of that mo monadic practice. The question for art schools to answer then shouldn't be how can we ensure that identification triumphs over rationalization. Uh, ultimately, that's identitarian thinking, and it will lead to an equity. A better question must be, what are the most productive and inclusive forms of identification? And in what, ways, what different ways might they best be rationalized? So by being rationalized, I mean, how is an institution as a set of resources organized to enable and disable these things. Um, and as a set of resources, it has many different things. It's material and human and, uh, and uh, financial and so on. So this is really a question that in the book I try and answer. And I do this by looking at different examples of art education. And I, I look at examples that are inside art academies and examples that are outside of art academies and, and, and various things in between. Um, so, for example, porous academies are uh, aca art academies that have. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, go back. <laughs> they're they're um, art academies that have um, more permeable boundaries, with the aim of trying to enable more kind of diverse or equitable forms of diversification. And there is a movement, a, a general movement, at a porous academy across art schools and universities, which, which is sort of recognize what I'm talking about here to some extent. And the, these kind of active forms of porosity are also enabled by integrated art curricula uh, because an integrated curricula is one that deliberately tries to sustain what Peter Senge called a learning organization. And it, it tends to be something that can try to synthesize or recognize the contradictions of these competing boundary rationalizations. Um, the competing boundary rationalizations are the ones here on the left in yellow. Most art schools and universities endlessly argue around these two schools, positioning school and the resource based school. But um, really what we need to do is overcome that binary and it's a kind of dead end. Um, I think um, it's a constant sort of move, movement back and forth. Uh, it doesn't really benefit uh, anyone in the end. And I think. Um, what we need then is some kind of organizational strategy for, for creating knowledge uh, that, uh, that's porous and, and replaces this kind of binary uh, positioning, resource-based uh, approach. Uh, so we need something that actively involves all participants in shaping the art school's resources and its environment. And the closest thing I've found to that is paragogy. A paragogy is 
a structure in which all participants act actively shape the, their own resources and environment. So um, to take this a wee bit further back in time, 2005, uh, the connectivist educationalist George Siemens uh, proposed this. He said, the organization and the individual are both learning organisms. Uh, I, I mean, that's a, cl a kind of classic connectivist position. Uh, so he says, they're both learning organisms. Increased attention to knowledge management highlights the need for a theory that attempts to explain the link between individual and organisational learning. So this is back in 2005. By 2010, paragogy has come along and it effectively offers this bridge between um, organisational and individual learning. Um, and it does this by picking up on peer-to-peer -peer, um, approaches uh, that are particularly prevalent among coders and um, some of the pioneers of, of paragogy are mathematicians uh, who uh, are using some of these techniques anyway and, and how they learn and teach. Um, a paragogy then is something uh, as a, a theory of learning that presupposes that a group of self-identifying peers will collectively constitute the organizational structure within which they operate. So this is going back to, you know, why do we assemble? Who, you know, who are we? What is it as a body? Why do we come together? Um, now this is key, I think, to enabling art schools to converge effectively with what's actually happening in their broader communities. A paragogy is something that asks students to openly demonstrate how they belong to and how they give shape to the world uh, and how they give shape to the art school and their peer group and how these organisations socialise everyone in those contexts as becoming artists. So paragogy, as I said, starts to come out around 2010. It comes out of this thing called the peer-to-peer -peer university, P P2PU, um, and it's it's something that's being experimented with by Joseph Connelly and Charles Dandoff. And really it's just a set of principles that they, they, they create uh, by appropriating a different set of principles and sort of rebranding re, uh, re them and, 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 and modifying them. And these principles create a flexible framework for peer learning and knowledge production. Now there are five principles. I'm going to outline them as quickly as I can. Uh, but at the same time, I want to show you how they're assembled from a set of already existing influences which are listed here. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of pepper what I'm going to say with some of these influences. So um, these are the five principles. Uh, you can look at them later, but I'm, I'm going to go through them one by one. Uh, the, as I said, they're modified from another set of five principles. They're modified from Malcolm Knowles' five principles of andragogy. Andrew Goggi means teaching adults. Um, now, the first principle is context as a decentered centre. Now, this idea is sensitive to the fluid dynamics of artistic practices and their co-constituted art worlds. And this is why it interests me. It sort of fits with what I discovered through practice itself, let's say. Uh, it considers art, in other words, as a shared context in motion, which involves understanding how art forms are constrained and enabled by interactions in the artistic field from which they're composed, and how the field is in itself composed, constrained, and enabled by art forms. So in this uh, understanding, uh, Corneli and Dandoff explicitly acknowledged the non-dualist philosophy of Basho, or place, which was developed in 1926 by Nishida Kitaro, uh, the founder of the Kyoto School of Philosophy. Basho avoids uh, European subject-object student-teacher dichotomies, and it, it's structurally, I suppose, a one way I think about it is it's a little bit like thinking of these uh, Russian nesting dolls where each babushka is in place in another, but we would need to imagine that the tiny babushkas extend infinitely and uh, tininess, and the big one just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So every single basho has a bigger basho, and every basho contains a smaller one, uh, as in placed, as, as Kitaro would put it. Um, now, paragogy's embrace of this basho bilateralism 
is in turn filtered through uh, the SECI model of organisational knowledge creation. I don't know how many people here are familiar with that, uh, but if you were in a business school, you would have heard of that. It's like common knowledge. And it comes from Ikajuro Nanaka's uh, SECI model quite specifically. Nanaka, heavily influenced by uh, Kyoto School. Um, Abasho, through taking through this SECI idea, uh, or a shared context in motion, which is, a, is how um, Cornelli puts it, is something that we can assemble really simply, simply by having a common catalyst for learning. So, uh, for example, a scaffold art assignment is something that can function as a kind of ready-made learning environment to analyze and critique. All you need to set a context in motion, and in the example of the art assignment, is a group of paragogs that will assemble and practice the same assignment. So, you know, the, the instruction build, that can be a common starting point. That, that's all we need. And, and thanks to, like, uh, say, connectivist learning theory, an assignment-led paragogy is something that you can form both in situ, so you could do it residentially, like in a, in a space like this, or you could do it at a distance. It can be done at, uh, online, let's say, or, or uh, you know, through a distributed community. Um, equally, the physical learning context, say the studio, the theater, the workshop, um, they, they can form the basho that triggers an artistic pedagogic. So placemaking is something that necessitates the kind of reciprocal participation that will facilitate pedagogic practices. As Cornelli would put it, we interact by changing the space. Okay, so that, that's a key idea, this, this kind of push and pull between the, the learners, the pedagogues, and the place in which they learn. The emplacement is crucially important. The, the second of the five principles is uh, meta-learning is a font of knowledge. This describes paragogy as a form of second order, double loop or meta-learning, which just means it involves learning about learning. Uh, now, uh, to illustrate this in an art context, we could say that really have you know, re really established uh, constructivist art teach teaching techniques such as the critique, <clears throat> which is widely used. Uh, they, they encourage students to develop meta-communicative meta practices by performing what we could call durable habits of mind. So when a, a, an art student is in a critique, they're performing a durable habit of mind, which hopefully will lead to this kind of meta-cognitive um, understanding of, uh, of how they're learning uh, and not just what they're learning. And, and in doing that, they will adjust their collective assumptions. So we, we want a good critique, not just to impact on a particular student, but on the whole group who are taking part in it, including the tutors. Now, this is um, a kind of meta-learning. However, I would say that in the form of the critique tends to look more exclusively in practice around each individual. And, and at most, I think it, it tends to only generate personalized learning networks. And in contrast, I would say what pedagogy does is take a more bilateral approach. So peers always have to consider how their basho or their shared context, let's say, constrains and supports their habitus. Uh, so from an organizational perspective then, pedagogues share their personal understanding, uh, understanding of the tacit theory and use within their group. So it's a bit like saying that they will always be aware that they're monads, that they, they have this self-consciousness about that. That's the, the tacit theory and use that underwrites what's going on. And they can start to kind of make that more explicit. And that makes the group uh, more aware of uh, what's going on, uh, what's, what's tacitly underwriting what they do. It gives them, as a result of that, the opportunity to remodel the governing routines and assumptions that underpin their habitus as a whole. So insofar as it maybe unmasks or begins to unmask the hidden curriculum that I spoke of earlier, paragogy overlaps with uh, what we could we would um, call organizational unlearning or what in uh, um, academia at the moment tends to be called epistemological decolonization. Um, now, the, 
the pedagogic practice of world building in this sense, this, this practice of creating a shared understanding is inherently post-rationalist. And by deliberating these normative assumptions as a group, peers will seek to continually transform their collective pedagogics. They're akin in that sense to participant observers insofar as they remain alert to how taking part in the educational system changes the system itself. So it's that going back to people like Nelson Goodman and Mary Douglas, it's about how an institution thinks, how it becomes an agent and can, and can change itself by thinking uh, in, its own, um, in, in, in its own right. So this enables that porous approach to organisational learning that I was talking about earlier. Paragogues are collectively aware of how the context they create constrains and supports what they're learning, and they recursively adjust their self-governance in relation to those environmental variables. And that is, uh, for, say, Cornelli, that's the thing that nurtures this kind of bilateral understanding of the relationship between making and being um, that, that's rooted in the, the idea of basho but is also very, very uh, familiar to anyone, say, who's interested in the idea of uh, experiential learning or learning by doing, say, you know, following John Dewey and Dewey's influence on North American art education in particular. So the, these are kind of recognisable concepts. It be a diff slightly different sort of uh, system or a different uh, language being used. So... To ensure that a paragogic form of play proves to be more pragmatic than idiosyncratic, Corneli advises here that we should co-develop empirical studies and a critical apparatus as a way of understanding what works and what doesn't. Now that might be, to some people, that might be a form of scholarship, of teaching and learning, but really uh, for paragogues, what it means is just that they should learn, ideally, in the open, in ways, in other words, that you can share uh, very easily and crucially that you can modify that other people can use and change and adapt to their own ends. And it's through doing this kind of open, like learning in the open, that they might then, or they do rather, start to assemble new forms of artistic learning. The third principle, paragogy, is peers are equal but different. And this really comes out of uh, Corneli and Dan Dandoff's reading of Baudrillard's uh, prosumer of language, which is an idea you find kind of filtered through a number of other things. It's, it reverberates in Alvin Toffler's 1980 book, The Third Wave, and in George Ritzer's work on prosumerist continuum. Uh, Ritzer's, a, I guess, a scholar of uh, globalization. So paragogy, uh, uh, clearly is trying to achieve what Ritzer calls balanced prosumption, um, which is a sort of balance between people who generate and those who ride on things, like vicarious learners, let's say. So if you create a, some sort of free resource, there's lots of people who just use it but never put anything back in. And then there's like usually a huge, <laughs> a really tiny number of people who make everything uh, but don't get much out of it. So a balanced presumption is a producer-consumer who are a balance between those, those two kinds of um, uh, positions you might take. Um, in paragogy, I suppose what that means is quite often it means working in relatively small groups where, in which there are no coaches, no educators, only learners. And it means fundamentally that uh, paragogues are expected to contribute, so no lurkers would be a, a kind of key role there. Um, peers might have a lot to learn from each other, but only if they have not all learned the same things in the same ways. So difference is a really important thing in a paragogy. The more diverse a group of paragogues are, the more likely they are to benefit from their diversity. So this third principle here offers an interesting rejoinder to uh, what I guess what I've often experienced as a sort of affirmative culture of the socialized studio where, you know, maybe people are kind of scared to um, uh, go, go, go tough on each other or where, where they uh, will tend to become less and less diverse over time. 
as they're socialised for, for longer periods of time. So what, what it does, in a, I suppose, is willfully introduce discordance and dissensus into peer group learning. So you have to make sure that it doesn't get cosy. You have to keep introducing different kinds of discordance, in other words. And that challenges paragogues to compose their own forms of, of pooling, uh, like pooling the resources, and thinking about how they can continue to ensure difference isn't debilitated by this kind of equity that they have as teacher learners. Um, the fourth principle is a really interesting one. Learning is distributed and non-linear. Now, a paragogy distributes learning and teaching across this network of peers. They each take responsibility for different aspects of a group project, and then they make connections uh, on their own before they coalesce and integrate what they've discovered. So they, they might start from the same point of origin, the shared context, but it's in motion, they go off, and then they reconvene, and they form a sort of confluence of networks. And while that principle, this, this kind of principle of, of um, distributed non-linear learning accommodates the widespread desire for artistic learning to be emergent, so it kind of allows that to continue to be a thing or uh, to be supported. It also simultaneously will generate social constraints, which will ensure that some form of shared context gets mapped out or materialized. And in that way, an individual emergent exploration is something that ultimately can be renegotiated in relation to a, a group journey as a whole. So it could potentially accommodate these two kind of this kind of diglossia, let's say. So for example, um, you see this, I suppose, a lot anyway uh, at the moment. There are lots of summer schools, social residencies, tons of associate programs that are run both by art academies and artist organisations. What they do, to some extent, sometimes quite explicitly, is distribute learning and teaching among a network of peers. Um, and they use techniques that they're drawn from online communities, such as swarming and crowdsourcing and such like. So paragogues are learning by reviewing what and how their peers have learned. And it's meta-learning that affords them a sort of perspective, let's say, to, to understand what it is that they need to redistribute among themselves. It creates that kind of self-awareness. Um, crucially, I'd say, however, where they might differ from, say, something like a summer school or an associates program, is that they try and make this, these kind of meta-learning opportunities openly accessible reproducible and scalable. So it's not just for a small uh, you know, cohort, a kind of selected cohort, people who can afford that, who can afford to travel or whatever. It's for everyone. And um, the last principle, the fifth one, is uh, realize the dream, then wake up. Uh, very uh, American. Uh, so um, I, um, what, I suppose what this, just, what this means really is um, Paragogues have to, you know, they've got to pause and observe their learning at some point because it's meta. So in doing that, they, they will awaken to what they've learned, they become aware of what it is they've learned and how they've done it. Uh, and in order to gain that kind of understanding, uh, or any kind of understanding, i.e. like realise the dream, what is it you're trying to you know, achieve or learn here, they need to learn when it's time to wake up. And when they do wake up, they need to move on. So it, what they're doing, or it's finished, you know, they've done that. They should, they should or they must move on to something else. Now, I think this is an interesting one in the sense that it captures something of this kind of ludic participation you find in a lot of artistic learning. Um, and that uh, a key thing there is that a paragogic practice only continues as long as players will happily volunteer their play. So we see that uh, even earlier today, like maybe like one workshop would continue uh, indefinitely and another would sort of fizzle out and, and that will, that's totally contingent on how long people are able to volunteer their play and how, you know, how, how involved they are ludically speaking. Um, what's interesting about that I suppose is that it kind of fits with the idea that art should um, be focused more on like open-ended, temporary, appetite-driven projects and it, and, and it would um, allow a kind of, at the same time, a sort of cyclical renewal and recursive maintenance because the group remain intact. It's just what they're doing 
changes. You know, they, they don't need to disband or, you know, um, uh, give in uh, to, to working, uh, you know, in a collective way. So I think as a result of that, that particular idea in the fifth principle, you find like uh, a lot of pedagogic projects are explicitly cyclical. Uh, a typical example would be the Sandberg Institute. Uh, temporary programs, uh, Jürgen Bay started in 2011. So say Vacant NL, it was a two year temporary masters that focused on empty, pro empty properties in Amsterdam and Netherlands. And over the process of the, that project, that, that program, it created this transdiscipline of vacancy studies and then it moved on. You know, the next program is about something else. It just keeps changing. Okay, so, um, I'll kind of come to the end of, of uh, the section where I'm talking the, the middle, the big middle, <laughs> talking about what, what's kind of going on in terms of transferable theory. A, a lot of what I talked about there is coming out of the book, but it's, it's really me trying to sort of consolidate sort of certain things that I'm doing anyway or a scene starting to create a certain kind of shape. Now I'm going to finish relatively quickly uh, 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 and at some pace. Uh, with just one example, as I said, so it's a, an example of a paragogics in, in motion or, or in formation. And as I said at the start, it's, a, it's kind of like a, an open educational resource and it's called Contemporary Art and Open Learning. And that resource serves as both an open resource for anyone and as a resource that's used by my own students for a part of their degree for which they will get credit if they, you know, if they pass the the course that it is part of. So this this material, the, the thing that I'm going to show you, is I guess it's been in the pipeline for ages and some of the things that are in it have been around, they've been in the open anyway, they're like openly published. But what I wanted to do with it was sort of pull it together and compose it. And I wanted to do it with colleagues who'd been part of that or, or were new is at the same time get them involved. And at the the point where I was able to do that was the summer of 2020 when we were in lockdown, uh, which was not ideal, but it wasn't why I did it. I didn't do it because we were in lockdown. I was doing it anyway. So the way we did it because we were in lockdown was uh, necessitated, uh, as it were, we couldn't get together physically. So we used a swarming technique. Uh, I've mentioned swarming already, but we used a form of like agile ideation and we built resources and aspects of the curricula, create different kinds of composition within it using Notion because it was free and easy to access. And we used a little bit, we used Miro a little bit, but that, that allowed us to see things holistically. So we could always see the whole thing at any given time. And if we change something, we could do that. Everyone else would know it being changed. So we basically swarmed it much in the same way that uh, pedagogic uh, publication is, is swarm authored. And then we created these learning shifts, <laughs> which are just these blocks of time. So things are like really time constrained. And that's a kind of deliberate tactic to sort of move things on and create some of that dynamic that I've been talking about in terms of these principles. And then we play tested what we created. So if I created a bit, a component of the we are someone else in the and the group would test it out and then and vice versa. And then we would sort of change it and recalibrate it. And once we were happy with it, we'd publish it on a WordPress. Uh, a WordPress. So it's just a regular bog standard WordPress because that's the easiest way of getting it out, um, which means it's completely open. And to license it, everything's got like a, a CC license on it. And every person who produces something has it licensed to them individually. So. Um, the course itself, the way it's structured, I'm going to really quickly explain what happens in it. The, basically, the first part of it involves creating a covenant, and that, that's called, we, we call it a uh, build a basho, which is a sort of joke, I suppose. But uh, <laughs> the idea really is that you get the group together, and the group define the parameters of their collective inquiry. So they, don't, they decide, more, they focus more on how they're going to build a, a, a basho, like what's that environment going to be and how they're going to work in it, what's the relationship going to be, what will they enable and disable and so on. And they do that more than, than think about what they're going to actually do. That's the kind of key focus initially. 
Um, and then we do work on these foundational peer-to-peer -peer concepts. So there's tons of stuff out there. It's all free, open source, uh, about peer-to-peer, -peer, um, let's say the open paradigm, you know, open access, open learning, open worlds, anticipate the art worlds, all that sort of stuff. There are techniques and tools you can learn, uh, swarming, collective inquiry, and so on. And then there's a whole uh, kind of history of, say, the educational term and art practice as well. So we're, what we're doing is like breaking up, and everyone will go off and do something. They'll, they'll kind of focus on some part of that, do some work on it, and then pull it back together and share it. So everyone's doing some research individually and then pulling it again. And it means you can get somewhere really, really quickly. And every time you look at the same thing, you'll get a sort of slightly different constellation of input. So, you know, there's several groups doing this separately, and each of those groups is doing it slightly differently because they're different. So, um, importantly as well, this is metacognitive. So we're learning about these kind of playful kinds of generative, artistic, open learning forms. And then we're, as I'll show you, we're going to make these things rather than just learn about them. So the thing we work towards, or the thing we worked towards at the end of last year, this time last year, was this open art fair. And we used as a catalyst, as this common inquiry, we chose this provocation that's usually attributed to Joseph Boyce, but it's not really Joseph Boyce as, as far as I'm aware. Uh, you had mentioned Kunstler, uh, and the way we uh, paraphrased it is, can anyone be an artist? So we took that idea as the sort of common point of inquiry to stage this sort of framework uh, um, that would allow everyone taking part in this to, to work towards producing something that would, that would kind of uh, respond to that question in a way that was open. Um, and I suppose what, what it did a little bit was it started to do a bit of a kind of hauntology of Joseph Boyce uh, and his time in Scotland. It was, this was the anniversary of Boyce at Edinburgh Art College and Strategy Gets Art and, uh, Get Arts and such like. So it, it, it allowed some of the students who were interested in that to pick through some of the things like the Edinburgh Poorhouse projects or the work he did with the the murderer, Jimmy Boyle, or, and, and think about how that is a kind of precursor to Scottish radical pedagogy and uh, things like the Ragged University, which is a, a kind of uh, a completely independent uh, pedagogic <laughs> university in, in Edinburgh. It's been around for a long time. Um, so that, that was the, the first one we did. The one we did very recently, which is November this year, was quite different. I mean, we were able to actually do this um, in person. <laughs> we did, it, it didn't have to just you know, be predominantly online. So we did the workshop, uh, the, the fair this year, it was hosted by Edinburgh Sculpture Workshop and it was outside in their yard. And uh, we did this thing called Artist Toolkits, which was really based on something that the Sculpture Workshop had done that emerged out of shift work, which I was talking about earlier. And basically, the sculpture workshop has started to commission artists to create toolkits that are then open. Anyone can sort of use them and engage with them. And sometimes it's kind of like a physical thing, and other times it's something that's kind of, let's say, more virtual. So we did that. Everybody created some kind of toolkit and, and shared it uh, in person, but then thought through the five R's, like how do we retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute these open toolkits as open educational resources. So can they be licensed? Can it somehow be converted or um, extended beyond the presence of the person who's created it? Can they you know, kind of let it go into the ether and have an open life of its own? So thinking through some of that, I guess, it had, it had a bit of a root in Boyce again. Your Boyce created these action objects, and the, the, the objects were not sculptures as such, they were like these catalysts for holistic relational learning, the way Boyce uh, thought about it. And in a way, I, I feel like that's still what's going on here. I, I guess the thing about the OER and the, you know, the open paradigm element is it's very explicitly focused on how we can fork and version and modify and how we might 
start to create these repositories of distributions and they in their own right might start to create further distributions of open um, um, objects. So um, the students were involved with a pipe factory, which is an art school that's been set up in the uh, Calton East End of Glasgow by Beth Danowski, who also was working on a, this course with me. And um, what happened as a result of that is that Beth was able to use some of the, not just the course materials, but some of the things the students have created in uh, a, a program that she teaches in at the same time in Glasgow. Uh, at Glasgow Clyde College, and Dibjani Banerjee, who run, runs the education program at the Sculpture Workshop, was able to appropriate and retool, reuse some of the things that we created with primary five children who are like seven, eight years old. So something that's coming out of a postgraduate context is also being used with like five-year-olds, and HNC students are generally like 16, 17. So, you know, it, it's very, very adaptable. And it's also been used, like last year, Nevin Lockhead, who's a curator in Kingston, Ontario, uh, and has this thing called Dark Matter Playgroup in a space. He created a version of the entire course, or rather his whole group created a completely new version of it by reappropriating what we've done, and they've called it Fabricating Vibes. So that's a, you know, that's a whole like, new um, distribution that's been created uh, out of what we started with. So just to kind of finish up on this then, I think like um, the way I see it at the moment is it's just the beginning of um, a set of possibilities that can emerge through the fact that we're trying to license and distribute these things in ways that are similar to how open education does this anyway. You know, this is already a movement and it's part of a, a kind of broader open paradigm. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's still very much rooted in the sort of environments that we, we recognise readily as, like, you know, art school environments. Um, but the key thing, I guess, is like um, it's it's become quickly kind of evident that it's still predicated on a lot of uh, relationships, let's say, that are kind of distinctive or, or or well understood at least among artists. So the key thing I'd say about it that I've I've become aware of in the last year, at least is that while in a lot of DIY or do-it-together initiatives, nurturing social relationships is usually something that precedes or even counters any desire that um, members of a group would have to codify their relationships. So they tend to resist organizing or collectivizing. You know, that's a, a thing in a way, almost it says DIT, art worlds or art, you know, do-it-together art schools. It's like a way of refusing the academy. We, you know, we are not an academy, we're not an institution. We're not gonna organize or collectivize, but of course they already have done that and they're in denial <laughs> of, their, of the fact that they are a universitas um, anyway. Um, but it's certainly what, ha what happens, I think, what brings those people together is that they have some kind of friendship. They have these social relationships anyway, they're already there and it, it, it comes first, that's what comes before. Uh, the codification and the incorporation, let's say. Um, so we need to kind of recognize that uh, that's not going to go away in a way. That's part of that socialization process I was talking about earlier. It's a result of that. But what, I, what I'd say is it's, it's post-rationalist. And it's, it, I suppose where the open educational resource idea comes in is that in, it's, it's predicated on the idea that it is there to support informal learning. It's not just for formal learners. Whether those formal learners are in Kuva or they're in a kind of alternative art school, they're still formal learners. And an open educational resource supports that, but it also supports informal learning. And for me, that's where it fits neatly with arts post-rationalist ethics of care, which is a way in which artistic knowledge creation is something as, as a kind of relational practice, it's something that's continuously modified through this process of doing it together. So I think these, these emergent artistic OERs are something that at least have this opportunity uh, embedded in them to create new publics for art through this commoning of uh, artistic learning. And I think it's through trying to embrace that idea of uh, the open paradigm uh, as a vision for education, that you can start to think about how art education becomes something 
uh, that, that maybe like fulfills UNESCO's and, uh, original idea of what an open educational resource would do. So it's, it's basically a, a thing that enshrines or supports the right to participate in cultural life. I mean, that is fundamentally what OERs are about. And that is, uh, I think, perhaps the promise of a, a, you know, a symbiotic uh, distribution and production of these uh, open forms of artistic learning. So to think of it as a kind of fermentation that's able to kind of look back on itself and generate these new worlds and these new, you know, these, these, these new um, <clears throat> uh, forms of habit is, is uh, um, at the moment uh, um, key to thinking about how, how we're going to continue to work with this uh, in the next year or so. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Okay. Okay, so we, um, Magnus and I wanted to, it's, instead of doing a sort of uh, respondent kind of provocation sort of thing, we thought we would do something that is a, essentially like a pedagogy and, a, and a, uh, using some of the things that I was talking about uh, as, a way, as a way of trying to engage with some of the things that I just spoke about. So what, what I've done is just pull this one thing out of the book <laughs> that I've been talking about and actually more or less quoted this quite near the start of when I was talking earlier. Um, and I thought we could use this as a, as a provocation and see what happens with it. And I think Magnus actually might have used this with some students or something like this uh, a, we, few, a week we, we or so the, ago. The, this chapter in the reading group, so the, the people who came to the reading group are going to be pretty familiar. Yeah, Good, OK, yeah, up. yeah, yeah. OK, so you'd use it. So anyway, I wanted to pull out this one bit because uh, I focused a fair but on just this thing, so I said very broadly, the art school is an association or a corporation, a body that forms whenever and wherever self-identifying art students seek to learn together. So there's a, kind of a number of words in there that essentially mean the same thing, corporatus and body and association and so on. Um, so taking that, uh, what I'd like to try and do is get everyone to, to, to try and think of like, what kind of answers you might give then to the question of what it is that actually um, allows you to associate. So what is the purpose of our association? Um, so, uh, you know, people who might uh, enroll as students in a particular course or a program or an institution, hopefully would have an idea of having some kind of purpose of association or something that brings them together. Uh, but of course, we don't always have that. So um, what, what I thought we could do is like break in uh, two groups in, in, the, in the room and just try in those groups to try to arrive at some kind of answer to this question. And as I said in the talk, there, there are kind of two subsets to this question, which are really the, the questions to try and tease out an answer to this. And the first one is, what is it that's to be learned? So if, you, if there's some way of identifying the thing <laughs> that's to be learned, that might be your purpose of association. That's why you've come together. Um, and if you're able to determine what that is, then maybe you can talk about how it's going to be learned. And, and embedded in those things then are, you know, the what is it, what's your concept of art or your, you know, your, your concept um, of, of the, the discipline and how it's to be learned that, well, that's the concept of studentship. That's how you model or subjectivize these individuals that come in, turn them into, you know, let's say, uh, sculptors or musicians or whatever it is they leave as. So, um, yeah, I'd like, I'd like just to start just for a, a little bit of time just to sort of break the room in two and see if we can have a discussion each side of the room <laughs> around these questions. And I'll just leave them up there. And you can kind of play free and easy with it. You know, if you feel like you want to focus on this what is to be learned aspect, that's fine. But um, trying to think about what that purpose of association is, is, is really the focus that we'll have just for 10, 15 minutes. And then I'll, I've got another thing that I'll throw at you that's a bit of a curveball uh, once, <laughs> once you've tried to yeah. engage with that. So, so Neil, I think I could start maybe with 
it's, I've been trying to formulate this question a little bit in my head, but it's to, it's to do with uh, some of the ideas you put across in the lecture and just uh, maybe asking for uh, a little bit of clarification on one of the early ideas or maybe to suggest perhaps there's uh, perhaps another way of thinking about it. So yeah. I think you started by explaining that the, that the art school is uh, a place where people come together to associate mm. uh, around a particular idea. Um, and then later on, you were kind of questioning the reliance on the studio or, 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 or a notion of a studio, perhaps to uh, articulate a particular kind of arts education and how that's used in, in you know, you gave examples of literature, mm -hmm. including from here, about how, how the uh, studio is this space. But I wonder if, um, you know, mm -hmm. quite, um, during the pandemic, I became really conscious mm. uh, because we had to suddenly articulate what a studio was. Yeah. Uh, so that it could remain open to the students. And this was at, at, at Manchester School of Art. Mm -hmm. And yet, obviously, what, what becomes incredibly apparent is that to an illustrator or a graphic designer mm. or an architect or an actor or a, or a painter or, or a sculptor, a studio is a, is a very different thing. So a studio yeah. is not kind of a fixed idea in itself. No. And so perhaps I was wondering if there's a, a different way of thinking about the studio, which is as the studio, as the space where that association happens. And therefore, yeah. Th yeah. What's, the problem is what's not being explained is what happens in the studio, mm -hmm. rather than the idea of the studio in itself. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, sense? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, well, let's just focus on fine art and forget about all the other places, the other disciplines that have, that have yes. studios. Because, yeah, you know, architects have studios and dancers have studios and so on. But I'm just thinking about fine art, and I'm thinking exclusively as well about European art schools, because they're different in America. <laughs> they don't have studios a lot of time. Um, but what I was saying is like the, what we understand to be the artist studio is a really specific thing that has come into existence not really that long ago, but and it only really seems to come into existence as the art academy is formed as well. So all these things are kind of happening at the same time. And before that, they don't really exist in ways we would recognize. And the people who, you know, were in workshops and so on before that point would not really recognize the sort of studio spaces we have in art schools. Um, and what I think is interesting about them um, in terms of like what goes on in them and what doesn't is they generally have, um, <laughs> excreted, I would say, the uh, workshop. So um, early Renaissance studios were a workshop, essentially. You know, it could be like a painter's workshop or a leather maker's workshop, whatever it is. And in a corner, there's a space for the, the artist, as, as at certain points would have been the master, and they sort of transform in the Renaissance into an artist, and they direct the work of the workshop. And over a period of time, they stop making things. They sort of become more like an architect who directs builders rather than, build, you know, as a builder. So it's a division of labor that forms. And over time, the actual physical fabrication facilities are taken out of that space. Or you, or you another way of looking at it would be the, the studio space is removed and set off somewhere else. And in art schools that I visit, except for the, you know, a few ex a few exceptions, it's a bit different in Norway, it's really different in Canada, in a lot of the United States, outside the Eastern seaboard, they don't have that. They still have the workshop is what they have. They don't have any studios, if they're lucky, in European terms, if they're lucky. When they're near the end of the studies, in their final year, they might get what we would call a studio, but basically they don't have them. And so everything's happening in workshops. And, you know, they're more invested in fabrication and using all those tools and techniques. And you, what we would think of as, uh, and the art school I work in as a technician doesn't really exist because that's who teaches. That's, that's the kind of main point of contact. So. I think um, even right now, we could just go not that far away from here to Norway and find a completely different sort of setup where there isn't really a studio as such in the way we're talking about it. So yeah, 
But how does it socialise people and... Is that what you're getting at? Like, what kind yeah, of... Yeah, well, I, I, I think I was supposing that it does socialise people. It does, yeah, totally, yeah. Um, what does and, it do? And, and uh, I think very deliberately in some art schools in, in, oh, in yeah. particular ways. And therefore, yeah. when... Uh, yeah, the literature about those courses doesn't unpack that when no. it says the studio performs a particular function. Yeah. It's not the studio, it's what happens in the studio would be my... Yeah, and so what's proposal. interesting though about a lot of this is that und and like fundamentally there's an assumption that just by putting some people in a room together, that's what it is, fundamentally that's what we're talking about, that they will socialise and become you know, driven by a common purpose of association. In actual fact, that's not what happens. They often fall out and they have all sorts of disputes, territorial ones, like that's my bit, and <laughs> it's like fights and all sorts of, you know, tears and over. And sometimes, you know, I have terrible, well, I've had terrible years where it's just been acrimony the entire year and then the next year everybody's great friends and they, you know, they hang out constantly and it's, a, it's really social. So, um, the bottom line is no one has ever uh, made any concerted effort to actually understand what might make it work well one year and not so well the next year. They just put it down to personalities. <laughs> that year just don't like each other and therefore there's nothing we could ever do to make it work. But they don't ever do anything to make it work. It's just stick them in that room and they'll some magic will materialise. So yeah, there's teaching takes place in the studio and there are group activities and so on, but none of those things are actually really about anything that happens outside of that contact time with the staff. They don't, they don't set up any kind of explicit or even implicit structure as to what would happen in between you seeing them from one week to another. And it's just kind of left for it's like it's kind of like an anarchy, you know. Like leave it to, like Lord of the Flies. <laughs> You're talking about the island. Leave him on the island <laughs> and see, see what happens, you know. Yeah. yeah. So that, I think that's what happens in a studio. That's my experience of what happens in studios. It's like Lord of the Flies. I'd like to argue more about that a little, but I, I want to open it up to to questions from the floor. If anyone has a a, a <laughs> question for Neil. I was wondering uh, how does uh, this model work for people who might be really introverted or um, yeah. neurodiverse uh, in a way that makes communication difficult or so socialization difficult? Yeah, yeah, it does work actually. It needs to be because they because the group need to create their covenant. Let's say. They're immediately really aware of that because they've got to talk to each other, let's say, to put it together. And we'd always have to do this in quite a small group. Six or seven is like the optimum number. So if someone's being very introverted or or have got no idea what people are saying, there's a linguistic or translation issue, the group have to acknowledge and accommodate that. So my experience is that it's tended to engage that better than not having some sort of covenant or some way in which a group would formulate how they're going to engage and relate to each other. Um, and I think also uh, assumptions that a, a member of staff might make about students are, are invariably just that. There are, some, <laughs> there are assumptions you don't know them initially and it takes a while to get to know students. So you, if you don't start off with something along those lines anyway, then you will eventually hit a wall. You know, you'll find that some students are, are, are being quiet or they, they're unable to engage. But I think the key thing I've found is because a lot of it is kind of blended, there's a lot of stuff that we'll do that um, would happen between face-to-face -face kind of contact or timetabled tutorials or what you know whatever it is that something that brings us together the way we are together right now like in between there's this space and time where other kinds of engagement take place that in thinking about what happens then uh, there's always a way to accommodate people who just don't like doing face-to-face -face stuff because you know it could be the 
for neurodiverse reasons or language or whatever it is. So I've found that that has actually really benefited over the last two years. And that was partly really as well that was accelerated because we had to get everything online or had to get some something online. Uh, Edinburgh Art College was, com uh, was locked. You could get in at all. Nobody was able to go in uh, until September this year. So we, you know, we had to consider those things. And um, it seems to me that you know, people who are engaged with like open education and things like that, pedagogy, that, that kind of way of thinking, they're really acutely aware of this sort of issue of engagement, non-engagement and everything in between. And, uh, and I think I've learned a lot from, uh, I suppose I'm going to do a, a bit of a crash course and <laughs> some of that. Um, so I don't know, I feel, I feel like those individuals are, are always the ones that struggle in things like crits and in a more conventional art school environment. They really struggle and they, and they would be like the last students to present something and have a critique of what they're doing and you know so whereas if you if you're more blended and have you know uh, a discussion about that right away just as, as everything gets started that's the first thing you do then the group plus the, the the tutors themselves are able to actually engineer and construct something around it that will you know be modified and and adapt to the actual uh, needs of the, the learners themselves. So I found it's been really positive, uh, in fact. Um, and it doesn't, the no lurker thing is a thing that Cornelli and Dandoff were really keen on. They wanted everybody to take part, but there's different ways you can participate, right? So you can participate in a quite quiet way and put something in. You don't have to be really vocal. Um, but you need to you need to do something. You've got to go off and do your thing and then put it back in the pot. So there's always a way that you can do it, that you can take part without having to be, you know, loud <laughs> or, you know, confident or whatever. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. So do you think that we really need teachers in art academies and schools? That if we think that uh, there is a peer learning, as we know that there is a lot, yeah. if we would just give facilities to the students uh, yeah. and let them be there and see what comes? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can do that and something will come of it. But personally, I think we do need teachers. And, uh, you know, interestingly, like Gert Biesta, has argued that recently, and he, he's he's like being quite critical of what he calls learnification, or like he said, I think he said, explicitly says, "Be aware of ignorant schoolmasters." So he puts it as well. Um, I think you do need uh, teachers, but I think one of the things that teachers might do is you know not just teach. They don't just teach anyway, but they might they might think a little bit more about what's available in terms of some of the things that I've been speaking about and how they might use those things. And I think teachers in primary schools or kindergarten, that kind of sphere, certainly like in Scotland are quite, uh, to my mind, they're quite um, experimental with things like that. They're real magpies. They're always looking out for different tools and techniques and so on along these lines that they might use with these young kids and you know how they might get them to form these peer groups and so on. And I, it feels to me that the, the older the student gets, let's say the further on in the system, higher ed and you know PhD and stuff like that, the, the further away we seem to get from, from an engagement with all of these tools and techniques. Um, so for me, it's not like we don't need teachers, it's more that we need uh, to continually ask ourselves as teachers like why and how are we doing things and you know what is this common purpose of association let's say or is there another way this could be done what would happen if we did it this other way so it needs to be quite experimental and ultimately um, 
what I'm talking about in terms of like peer learning or uh, pedagogy, um, what I'm doing with it, I guess, is in an educational setting, is, is I guess kind of drilling it and appropriating what I feel I can take and make use of and get it to work in an art school environment. So it's kind of learning from it and learning about what works well in it and then appropriating it and maybe making something new from it. Um, so I, I mean, yeah, I guess personally, I, I feel like it's not, it's not a dogma, you know, openness is not a dogma, it's a continuum. You can be, you know, you can be a bit open and that might be better than not being open at all. And equally with like a pedagogy, you could do a bit more peer-based things and maybe think about about that more carefully and, and fine tune it and try and make it work better. And that would be, to me, better than not doing it at all or, you know, or just keep keep doing the same thing when it's not working. So it's for me, it's more like a continuum rather than a dogma, like we need to get rid of the concept of teaching. And, uh, and I think that um, whenever, institu whenever institutions remove teaching from the names of committees and replace it with learning or education, they're missing half, you know, teaching and learning have to be together. They're like... <laughs> Yin and Yang, and, and you know, they're missing a really, really crucial thing. You can't just have learning without teaching. They, they do go hand in hand. So um, pedagogues are teaching each other. They're, they're learning, but they're also teaching each other. So if I go off and find something out and bring it back and we pull it, then I become the teacher while I'm giving that to everyone else and, and so on. You know, we're moving around a group and everyone's putting something in, so you're you're moving, you're constantly moving back and forth between a teaching kind of subject position and then being a learner and then a teacher and a learner. And I, I suppose what we did earlier today, we swapped a couple of times. Every time there's a swap, like if a group is here and they design something for another group and that group comes over takes part in that, they suddenly move from being teachers to learners, but they're, you know, they're both having that cyclical sort of exchange. And it's the alterity that's really important as well. Like, we shouldn't just be teachers all the time, and students shouldn't just be students constantly. We need to swap and take up those different positions, at least now and then. You know, so you need the world upside down, at least occasionally, <laughs> but ideally more more of that movement back and forth is healthy, I think. So it's a sort of continuum rather than a, we need to get rid of this and start doing this instead. Yeah? <laughs> Any, anyone else with a question? I think everyone's <laughs> probably, probably feeling a little bit exhausted. <laughs> so I just, I mean, Biesta in a way goes, goes further. Yeah. So, I mean, Biesta uh, says there's no point in talking about learning because we do it all the time. Mm. So we we, should, we might as well focus on the teaching mm. because the learning bit is it, it just happens. So how do we how do we think about teaching? He's quite you know says yeah, that quite explicitly. I, I think that I don't think that's right. I think uh, there's a continuum of learning as well. So there's informal learning and there's formal learning and there's like learning things that you want to learn and things you learn and things you don't want to learn and everything in between. So yeah, we do learn all the time. But well, you could say the same thing then about teaching. You know, <laughs> we kind of teach all the time as well. Yeah. So I don't really buy that, but I think he's right to question the learnification, as he calls it, of everything. Because it's a sort of euphemism that's like, let's be uh, sustainable, which usually means let's cut the budget. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, My question um, concerns the... You talk a lot about in peer teaching or peer learning. You refer to tools, tools and uh, techniques. Mm. Yeah. So it, it's, they sound very much of the the old like the techne uh, art, the artist uh, school that mm. that is based on craft teaching, crafts and skills. So mm. how do how does this differ? Because and this is my first question, and the second one relates to um, 
the sort of the verbal and uh, verbal uh, exchange that takes place, especially like this, this morning when we were doing things, it, it's based yeah. on sort of verbalization and writerly practices. So, <clears throat> yeah. so how do the, these relate to peer, peer learning and peer teaching? Mm -hmm. uh, are they based on model schemes, uh, toolkits, a set of things that can be taught easily? In a, yeah. in a sort of, and how how much verbalization, how much writerly practices, and how much, yeah, is needed. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, where yeah. where does the body and embodied exchange come into to place, and how do you how do you pass uh, yeah. that on? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, it's funny actually. There's a slide in there that might be useful with that. It's kind of hidden in the background, but I could probably show you. I'm never going to find it. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Um, so there's a couple of things hidden in the background here that maybe point to that. OK, so see this thing here? Um, these objects that are kind of on the edge of this image, are they have there's no writing anywhere attached to them or anywhere close to them. It, nothing that explains what they are. And in a way, these are toolkits, so these are made as a toolkit, and they're left with no explanation as to what you might do with them. And it, they're meant to be, the person who made them kind of was thinking of them as a sort of like alien object, and they're for, they were specifically meant really for like kids to play with, but the, the idea was that they, they construct them into something that um, is, is like a the communication device, that's, that's the idea. So they don't really require anything along those lines. But then you might get something that is very verbose or requires quite a lot of written instruction. I guess, you know, the, it could be only that. In fact, it doesn't need any materials. In some ways, the things that were made earlier today, they were just a, you know, a couple of simple written instructions. You didn't need anything else. So it could be either. You know, you, I've had a lot of things created or witnessed their creation by peer groups that are effectively mute, like they have no language or no spoken language or no writing attached to them. And, uh, and they've kind of come through almost like the groups um, early on saying we're not going to have any language or no one's allowed to speak, which <laughs> funnily enough, you know, happened again today, no speaking was one of the, one of the sort of prohibitions. And then I've had, no speak, it's silence, yeah, but I've, I've had, um, I've certainly had things where the group have actually started by creating a covenant before they go on to do anything else, and they've, without thinking about the repercussions, they've censured something, said we're not going to have any talking, and then they've had to stick to the rule doggedly <laughs> and design something that has no talking in it, and so that's often really interesting because that's a really hard thing to produce. But when people are creating something where they don't have that restriction, they will often end up using writing or something like that, maybe maybe audio prompts or something like that. But I think um, it could go either way. You know, it could be like incredibly literary, maybe even quite verbose. And then it, it, equally, it could be something that's, that's kind of mysterious and, and is like a smell or a... <laughs> a sound or, or a, a, some visual prompt, but it, it really, I don't know where it will go until the group start to kind of put their context in motion, and, and it's only when they start to sort of say this is the context we're creating that they then are able to make this thing inside it that, that is sort of governed by that logic that they have, that they have arrived at. Um, so I really don't know where it will end up. Um, and that's kind of the fun thing about it. It's like a bit of a journey and there's always a surprise in it. Um, and it's always different every time. I could run the same thing, that is the exact same starting point, and every single time it will go somewhere that I, I never could possibly have predicted. So, yeah, I don't know. It could could be either way. It, it, you know, if you wanted it to be non-linguistic, let's say, you, you could just create that as an immediate prohibition. We're not going to have any <laughs> any writing. It has to be uh, language and, and writing free. 
And, and so, um, you know, if we're thinking about uh, tacit to tacit learning and, that, and we want to focus really on that and get a peer group to do that, then we, we, we could say that's the defining parameters for that group, just as much as we could do exactly the opposite if you see what I mean. So it's all down to how you immediately create that kind of basho or you know, learning space, let's say, wh whatever you want to call it. It's how you determine the edges of it and what's allowed to be in play and what's excluded from your, your play. And that's it. I mean, it's that simple in, in the end. <laughs> I don't know, does that answer your question though? Sort of, yeah. But yeah. The, what's shareable? Yeah. The question of what is shareable and how yeah. it is maintained by the group. Yeah, um, so yeah, yeah. So that's perhaps and so what people are committed to, the one that we were discussing earlier on. Yeah, what so do people, peers, commit to when they are in a peer learning situation? Oh, what are they committed to? The actual peers themselves. Well, this is the thing for me is like I always prefer to do this where an invitation goes out to as many people as I can possibly invite within what you, well, we're not in that anymore, but <laughs> then the realms of, uh, you know, consent to signing up for email lists and such like so put it to as many people as possible. Don't know who's going to turn up, but there's like a random group of people will turn up to say shift work. And that's always the case when we're trying to create something that's new. So we're maybe making a whole new series of workshops and play testing them and so on. And um, they're there because they want to be there. So they've volunteered to come. And if they want to leave, they just leave. If they don't like it or something, they, they can walk out and sometimes do. Uh, but they're there because they want to spend time doing that. So they've got that like purpose of association. They feel invested in it. And they tend then to be really into it. You know, it's like it's a game they they get drawn in. And the way that you would watch in a movie or something like that, or playing chess or that kind of thing. And that's a big part of it, is, is just that. So you can't force people to play. They have to give their play voluntarily. And that's always the thing that underwrites it. And uh, it's kind of, it's the same if it's done in a formal educational environment. Because fundamentally, Students can just walk out of things, and uh, certainly they can in Scotland. There's no penalty. I mean, I couldn't, I can't make people be anywhere, and I wouldn't want to do that. And if they don't want to do it, then it's probably because it's not very good, and you know we need to then try to do something else or come up with a different way of engaging them. But I think uh, <laughs> it's just e it is always easier to do it when, or it works better generally speaking, when people just volunteer to take part in it. And if you have to somehow force people to do anything along those lines, where there's a peer dynamic that's really important, it just doesn't work. You know, it's, it, it will just fall apart. Uh, that, and that, that, I've never really had to do that, to be honest, but I've seen things where there's some kind of, what would you call it, like a, this is compulsory or it's part, you're going to get assessed on this thing, you have to turn up. And it's generally, uh, it's generally quite bad because people don't really want to be there. They don't really, not, there's no generosity or anything, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's it. I think that's a key thing. <laughs> it's going to be voluntary. Voluntary, yeah. Yeah. And I, th I, I think that's the end of the voluntary yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. So listen, yeah. um, I want to say thank you for everyone who's, who's yeah, come today yeah. and thrown themselves into all the ex exercises with precisely the kind of yeah. generosity that Neil was talking about there at, at the end. Um, yeah. I think there's, I hope there's things that people are going to take away and things that they're going to kind of chew on. I think for me, there's been as many uh, problems, I think, that have arised in my head that I think I need to go away and kind of work through in one way or another, um, but perhaps also um, practical models which we might be able to, in one way or another, bring in to our teaching at the same time. Um, I'd like everyone to uh, thank Neil as well at the end of the day. So thank you so much, Neil, for your Thanks. generosity. <laughs> I've, I've just before we finish, I, I put um, most of the things that I've been talking about up on, on here, on the left. 
under that cover, and I'll update it and put a, a few pictures of the things that were created earlier, and so, there's a few like templatey things that I've been using in the background, and I'll share them as well. You could just like download them if you want to use them. Um, the thing that's on the other side is the course that I was talking about, and that's also just open, and you could just go in and pillage it uh, and use it however you see fit. But that's that's what they are. But okay. not sell it. Eh? You don't sell it. Yeah, it's not for resale. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Non-commercial license. That's right. So um, yeah, they're both just there, and I'll I'll like um, add a bit more to what's on this one when I get um, a few minutes. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks again.